I have to admit, I have no idea, bluntly, where this devotional is going to go. I kind of took a look at it, and I don't know whether we're going to put this in Wasachers or daily devotions or where we're going to go with this one because it's it's kind of interesting because this is the first time that I get to talk about let the Spirit of God that dwells within me by the gifting of that with which He's given me by the laying on of hands by the administration of His Spirit by the very fact that Jesus spoke to me and speaks to me and calls me by name and tells me that which He chooses to use me in the capacity with which God has anointed me and appointed me to be ministering and feeding his sheep, I I really don't know quite what to say. You know, I I sat and I have sat in the congregation of the mighty. I mean, I, I there's no doubt about it. I mean, there have been places and churches that I've gone to and ministries that were like, wow, you know, and you just go, whoa. And I don't mean all Calvary chapels. I mean other big giant ministries, Full Gospel Businessmen's Association, Billy Graham Evangelical Association, um, Melody Land, TBN, CBN, you know, um, gosh, you name it, people that came along, Morio Cirillo, uh, even people like Benny Hinn or others, you know, and you just go, man, what am I doing here? <laughs> and yet, the wind bloweth whither it will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going, so too is everyone led by the Spirit of God. If it so be that you get the opportunity to go, then go. You never know what God may use you as. It could be as responsible as those types of people that are in leadership that think they're leading, or as minuscule as, you know, sweeping up leaves like I've been doing lately, and I'm probably going to do today. But in each situation, if you don't take Jesus with you, then you've left Jesus behind. One of the things that I heard last night was nothing about Jesus. As a matter of fact, I heard a lot of people complain about different things and all of them were pretty much the same. None of them were fed. None of them had heard the Word of God. None of them really felt as though they had gotten what they came for. And that was to be inspired to go on through their week knowing that Jesus is with them. Because you see, where I'm at right now in this growing ministry is there's a lot of hurt people that really want to know Jesus in a personal intimate way. A lot of them do know God and they do know the fact of the reality of religion and they've seen people come and go. They've seen the people who talk the talk but often don't walk the walk. You see, when you see a man of God, you expect certain things to be real in their life. Signs and wonders do accompany those who believe. The fact of joy is present in their life. The overwhelming demonstration of love actions is there. You know, the love actions of, have you gone to the prisons? Have you gone to the hospitals? Are you there? And do you care? Now, I'll admit, in this ministry I'm in, it's the first time I've ever had any pastor, and I've been involved in small ministries starting up before, but it's the first time that I've ever had a pastor call me on the phone. Really. I I'm serious. I've been so much involved in different intimacies with different leadership people that, um, you know, they showed up on my door, you know, and they've been with me, you know, but it's the first time that I've actually had somebody call me. It was kind of nice, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying to compliment this part of the person. And it's like, wow, this guy cares. He, he, he cares enough to call. And I'm glad that he did. You know, I'm glad that he chose to do that. But you know, the more that I watch, the more that I listen, the more that I hear, the more that I see, the more that I handle with my own hands, I watch the, the desire to bounce from one to another to another to another and touch base with each one. I remember a young man that I used to minister with, you know, or I was sent to minister to. He was an interesting person. His name was James Yaney, as a matter of fact. And God bless him. He's got a ministry right now on the web that takes people out mountaineering. You know, they. He says, you know, he's got a PhD now. You know, a master's degree in psychology, sociology, uh, counseling, whatever it is. You know, master's degree, master's degree. Um, 
the guy's a flake. I mean, he, to me, you know, beyond any shadow of a doubt, there's no doubt whatsoever. The guy's been a flake, always was a flake, and still is a flake. He operates according to what that type of ministry where he has to get fame and claim and be kind of like supported by those who look up to him and have to, he has to have the limelight, you know. He has to be the center of attention. He has to fill that void inside. And it's not like a roaring lion seeking about whom he may devour or that he has this emptiness. No, it's really just a lot of hurt that he has inside. And I spent many years ministering with him and ministering to him until finally I just had to get away from him because it was like, man, the hole is deep, you know, God, and it's just overwhelming. And people used to say it was like, it was like nitro and glycerin. The two of us would get together and, oh yeah, ministry would happen because he was one of those kind of like effervescent people. He had that charismatic personality. He told good stories. As a matter of fact, they were real neat. I went mountain climbing, you know, and, and I, God was there, you know, God was in the hills, God was in the mountains, God was in the sunrise, God was there. You know, I mean, he just had this way about him, you know, that was not poetic like I just did, but telling these interesting, and he had a caricature type of face, that he would always make it interesting, and yet there was nothing sustaining. In other words, it was nice to hear what he was doing. It was good that you wanted to love the guy, you know, and I still love the guy, you know, it's like, wow, cool, you know. God could use the guy. But he never wanted to submit under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He never wanted to fully yield his life to the Lord. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. Sadly, to this day, he'll never reach the potential of all that God wants to use him for, even though God's blessed him. God's blessed him in his education so that he would grow up into the man that he should be. He's blessed him in multiple marriages so that he's finally got one that I think he's going to stay with. And He's going to be able to, you know, have that maturation process of dealing with another person and growing up in that relationship, I hope. He's got a ministry that he's, you know, says is revived again, you know, and you know, he's doing it again, you know, and taking kids and troubled people out and hopefully there are enough support networks around him that are supporting him in that type of ministry. But the interesting thing was it wasn't about Jesus. You know, you could tell very quickly if you just asked yourself this question. Well, many times, and this is what Romaine taught us, how many times did you mention Jesus? Now, I personally know that that's kind of like a dogmatic thing. Maybe it's not the best way to evaluate things. Maybe the Holy Spirit's telling you it's not what you do. But it's not a bad rule of thumb. I sit down, you know, oftentimes in counseling sessions, and I listen to people tell me all about everything else, and usually they don't tell me anything about the Word of God. They won't tell me about what Jesus spoke to them today. They won't tell me about, you know, what God has done in their life. They'll tell me about what maybe happened in the past or what they think, but I don't often hear about Jesus. You know, so I just start talking about Jesus, you know, and they, they either fall in love with Jesus or they get out because at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you talk enough about Jesus, you're going to drive somebody nuts because they're going to call you a Jesus freak. Because after all, it's all about you and not about me. The glory goes to God. So, I'm not sure where this devotion is going, but I, I do know that my emotion is wrapped up in what I heard recently, and I'm just dumbfounded by the reality of thinking of Moses and Aaron. Now, Moses and Aaron were two interesting people. They were brothers, basically. Moses had been raised separate from his brother and you know his brother had been raised in oppression and Moses was raised in succession Moses had a wonderful life he obviously was a stutterer you know he had some issues but he was raised in Pharaoh's court now when he was brought down meaning that he was down seated you know because the scriptures teach that God knows our uprising and our downsetting and that's meant in a table of you know, of uh, honor in a table of authority where you seat people at the right hand and at the left, where you seat people up table and down table. I mean, you the presidency knows this and state dinners, they know this. And you the closer you are seated to the person that's being honored, 
the more you are up seated and then down seated. And that's where that up seating and down seating, or my uprising and my down seating nose comes from. Usually when you stand up, that means you're rebellious. When you're down seated, that means you've been set down. You've been placed in a lower position. And so Moses was down seated. He was down put. He was, he was lowered that he might learn how God and what God wanted for him. Because he went out and tried to do it on his own. He tried to do it his way, and he went out and killed an Egyptian, and didn't work that way. <sighs> and so, <clears throat> once he did it God's way, he went out and took the children out of Israel, out into the wilderness. Now in the wilderness, they were like, hey, we've been assimilated by Egyptian culture. You know, we've got all these issues and problems, you know, and Moses is trying to explain to them, and teach them, and guide them as they're rebelling against him. You know, his brother, his sister-in-law, Miriam and Aaron, quite frankly, as well as some others, Dathan and those that were like just totally rebellious against the man God uses. And so I kind of find it interesting was that Moses finally gets them to where they're supposed to be, you know, at the foot of the mountain to worship the Lord. This is why God brought them. God says, bring them to a place so that they can worship me. Okay, cool. I like worship. I'm there. Hey, I'm ready to be at the mountain. You know, I'm ready to go down the mountain with the people. Down in the valley, we got all the people. You know, they're all ready to worship. So <clears throat> Moses says, okay, you stay here and I'll go up. You know, first of all, God comes down. God comes down the mountain and there's thunder. Wow, there's lightning. Wow, there's explosions of demonstrations of power. God is present. God is there. It's like awesome. Everybody and all the people are looking at it going, Oh no, we're scared. So they say, Moses, you go up the mountain. Remember that? It wasn't Moses saying, I'll go up the mountain and come down and tell you. He didn't assert himself. As a matter of fact, the people made the declaration, You go and tell us what the, what the Lord says. You go and tell us what the Lord will do. And Moses goes up the mountain, and God says, you know, tell the people don't come up the mountain because, you know, they're, they're full of sin, you know, and they'll die. You know? So Moses goes up the mountain. Moses spends time with God. Moses is up there in the presence of God, learning and listening to what God would have for the people. Moses didn't ask the people, what do they want? Moses didn't come to the people and say, how do you want it? Where do you want it? When do you want it? And what are we going to do to get more of you about it? He didn't ask them that kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, Moses just went up the mountain. That's all. The moment he's there, God says, look, at some point in time, uh, tell you what, Moses, it ain't working out this way. You and me, God, you know, um, Moses, I, I'm God, I'm holy, I'm the creator of the universe, I can do anything I want to. I can, I will, and I shall. So, here I am, I am that I am. Moses, I want to wipe out all the people. I'm sorry, but, you know, it just isn't working out right. The people are down there, and they're partying hardy. They are into everything that I have told them not to do. As a matter of fact, I don't even want to deal with them anymore. I want to wipe them out. I want to completely annihilate every man, woman, child, beast, and everything that's down there, because they are unholy. They are not doing what I want them to do. They are not accomplishing my purpose. Tell you what I'm going to do, Moses. Give you a deal here. You and I, I'll start over with you, and I'll begin again, and we'll make a great nation. And we'll start all over. You're here. You're with me. You're seeking me. I'll begin with you, and we'll, we'll do it. What did Moses do? God forbid, Lord, for your own name's sake, what a humiliation it would be for the people of the land to see those that trusted in you, those that came to you, those that want to know you are going to be annihilated by you. Those that you saved, your name would be treated as derision. Oh, God forbid that you should be so removed from the glory and honor that you are, that you would take and eliminate all these people. No, take me. Blot out my name from your book of life, but spare the people. God save the people. Wow. Hmm. That's interesting. Moses interceding like Jesus for the people. Now I do know about another person who was anointed or was going to be anointed. He was called to be the priest of the people. 
he was going to be like the priesthood, the very person that, you know, the people chose, the people said, hey, you're the priest. We want you to act like a priest. We want you to act like the leader. We want you to be what you're supposed to be. Let's have a calf. Let's worship and party. You make it, we'll do it. So Moses or Aaron says, okay, tell you what, people, if you really want a calf, if you really want, you know, to worship, you know, and have a party and celebrate, then tell you what we're going to do. Tell you how we're going to celebrate it. We're not going to do this pagan holiday thing, you know, that we came out of Egypt, but you bring me your gold, you know, all this stuff that God blessed you with. You bring me the money, honey. You bring me everything and I'll, I'll fashion it, you know. And so they started bringing it to Aaron. And he started working with his hands. He started forming it to what he knew from previous experience to do. He knew that if he gave the people an object of worship, they would worship that object. Now, he didn't know anything about God, really. He was a priest, but he didn't know anything about God, not really. As a matter of fact, if he did, he wouldn't have done it. But instead, he chose to obey not what God might have been saying in his heart, because God, I'm sure, warned him. God, I'm sure, spoke to him, because after all, he was a priest. And he's the brother of Moses. And he is the children of Israel. And he has been in captivity. And he is assimilated. But God says, I want to wipe them out. So we see Aaron responding to what the people want. And sure enough, once they got what they wanted, they took it, used it, and abused it. I've seen that a lot. I've seen where God gives a man what he asks for. God forbid. I've seen what happens when a ministry gets what they ask for. God forbid. I've seen what happens when churches get what they ask for. God forbid. I've seen what happens when God says, Look, I will take you into the land and I will bless you. But once you've been blessed, are you going to turn your back on me? Are you going to love me as passionately and as fervently and as wonderfully as you did when you didn't have and you weren't in the land and you depended upon me daily for your sustenance? God forbid. I see, in essence, many people in America taking for granted the reality of what they think as opposed to what God said. You see, I read the book of Acts specifically, and I see something that said, you know, the people got together and they sold all they had because their possessions were possessing them. Their possessions in a Jewish culture was very much determinant upon who you were and your status in the community. If you had great possessions, oh sure, every 50 years you would be equal with every other Jew in the land. Because every 50 years, whether you're in captivity or not, according to the priesthood, you were brought back to the reality of existence of the commonality of all of the children of Israel. You had an equal footing and an equal standing before God. Equality. Every 50 years. Now the reality of what God was doing in that was that he was trying to show that we are all sinners. Every man is equal in his sight. Every man is in need of grace. Every man needs to find his place in the economy of God, which really is just simply God can use anyone. God can anoint and appoint anyone. As a matter of fact, God often chooses and uses people for examples. Sometimes a good example, sometimes a bad example. Some of the people that I've met in life were bad examples of good grace. You know, meaning that, hey, they're saved, but God knows I wouldn't take anyone to their ministry. Heck no. I want to take people where they get to know Jesus personally. I want to take them where they get to be in that place of still waters. Where even as somebody prayed recently that the Lord is the shepherd and he will make them to lie down in green pastures. And they will be fed of the Lord. And they will be hearing God's voice. And they will be knowing the Lord. Because isn't that what a church really is? Psalm 23. Isn't it really a place of refuge? A place to come and get the Word of God? If I can't get the Word of God at church, where do I go for it? Oh, read your Bible. Well, yeah, but if the ungodly 
can't get it there, and the godly don't get it there, where do we go? Well, let's go to Aaron. Let's get what we can from Aaron. Let's take Aaron off of the internet, no matter who he is, and let's use him instead. Let's use him as our leader. Let's pick and choose whom we will use because we can, instead of the man God anointed, the man God appointed. You see, I find it interesting is that many are called, but few are chosen. Lots of people hear the call of God. Lots of people start off well, but they don't finish the course. They choose to go the way of Cain, or the way of Abel, or the way of Balaam, or the way of Balak, or the way of Aaron, or the way of Judas, or the way of the Ananias, or the way of Sapphira, or the way of the man Jesus who looked like he had miracles because he was imitating Paul, or he was imitating Peter, and he was following after them saying, oh, the God of. No offense, you know. I don't want to be any of those. I don't want you to follow any of those. I would prefer that you quit being phony and you be real. If you're not listening to God's voice, if you're not hearing God speak, don't do it. If God isn't personal and intimate and real, go find out where He is because you've lost Him somewhere along the way. If you are putting your entire stock and trade meaning every single thing you have into God's hands and then taking whatever else He doles out to you, you really aren't serving the Lord now, are you? You are serving yourself and you have been blessed by God. But in that blessing, have you turned your back on the Lord your God? Have you gotten comfortable in your quote-unquote ministry? Or have you got comfortable in your job? Have you gone beyond this, you know, newness of birth stage to where suddenly now you're going, well, what happened? We started off so well, and now we don't know what we're doing. How did we get distracted by the attractions of doing what other people are doing? You know, we want to be like them. We want to be big. Oh, we want to be like them. We want to be small and strong. Oh, no, we want to be like them. We want to be, like, tight and right. Oh, no, we want to be like them. We want to be, you know, like just intimate and real. We want to have worship like them. Well, but, you know, but we're not like them. We want to be like, you know, worshiping as they are, but we don't really worship as they are. We want to grow, you know, these people into ministry, but, you know, we really don't because they're not ready and they don't have the credentials and they don't fill out the paperwork and they haven't been anointed. We don't lay hands on them. No man suddenly, you know. Okay, no. The only thing I know about laying on hands is funny because I've been hearing this a lot term a lot lately. Lay no hands on man suddenly, you know. It's like, well, yeah, don't do it suddenly, but do it. <laughs> I often hear people use and abuse the things God tells them. I'm always like, I qualify God, you know. It's like if God tells me something, like I go, okay. If I got a word that God said, don't do this, I'd say, okay, now God, I want to make sure I understand this. I don't do that, but do you want me not to do it that day, that week, that hour, that minute, that year, the rest of my life? You know, Come on, God, let's get some parameters here. You know me. I need to know more specifics here, you know. You gave me Ten Commandments, we got 613. And it's not 643 or 683, it's 613. <laughs> we added to it, God, but we wanted to make sure we got it down, you know. And God honored it for centuries. Sorry. You know, a lot of people go, oh, well, you know, those Protestants, you know, they screwed up. Not for centuries. Or those Methodists, or those Quakers, or those Calvinists, or those Arminianists, or those whatever. Even the Catholics have Christians in them. Hello? And yet I always hear this thing about once a ministry has gotten like off track, then suddenly everybody else is wrong. And what they're usually saying is wrong about them is right before their eyes. Because the exact same thing that they complain about, or that they say they should be about, is what they're not doing. As a matter of fact, yesterday I heard something very interesting. I heard someone say, you know, we should not evangelize by telling people what's wrong. We should talk about Jesus. And I about fell out of my chair. Really? Could we do that in a service? You know, talk more about Jesus? Could we 
do what we are telling others they should do? Can we not be a hypocrite about our own words condemning us or confirming us? You see, one of the things that we should do is we should examine ourselves to see if we be in the faith. And I know that the sincerity of everyone is that everyone wants to do that. But lots of times people don't know how to do that. A lot of people will say, well, you know, I got, I got an hour, you know, so I'm going to sit down and ask God to speak to me in that hour, you know, and if God doesn't tell me what it is, I don't know what it is. You know what? I ain't going to church until God tells me to go to church. I'm not going to jobs until God tells me to go to the job. I'm not going anywhere or moving or doing or being or existing or living or breathing except God says, breathe. Because I don't want to be caught without God anywhere at any time. Matter of fact, I want God to convict me. God, convict me my sins. Bust me, Lord. I know there's pride. Bust me. I know there's ego. Bust me. I know I need to be crucified. Kill me. As one ministry says, from Raul Reese's ministries, um, his son, on the whosoever's, murder the flesh. Yeah. Because, you know, I see a lot of ministries that, you know, they're, they're looking around and going, well, how come they're blessed? How come they're growing? How come they're knowing? How come they're flowing? How come they're showing? How come they're living? How come they're being? Very simple. They're doing it. Literally. They're just doing what God tells them to do. No greater, no lesser. Matter of fact, it's humorous because I was just hearing about, you know, one man looking at one man's ministry and the other man's looking at everybody else's ministry. It's like, you know, they're, they're all looking around at, well, wow, you know, look what they're doing, you know. Okay. <laughs> I don't care. How about we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith? Interesting that he's called the author and the finisher. Where in between did Jesus tell his disciples what to do? What did he tell them to do? Feed my sheep. It's not complicated. It's not brilliant, you know, theology. It's not really that hard. And it's not like we're imitating the Jesus movement, and yet we are. It's not like we're imitating the Protestant movement, yet we are. It's not like we're imitating Catholics, yet we are. It's not like we're imitating Jews, yet we are. It's not like we're imitating what God said to do from the very beginning of creation, yet we are. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it when thou risest up, when thou sittest down, when thou travelest, when thou walkest, when thou puttest. Put it as forefronts before thy eyes. Do it as even unto the Jews or the Orthodox are trying to write it and make it and scroll it and then remind themselves to be in the Word. And I don't mean get up every day and read your Word. Baloney! What good is reading the Word if you never hear from God speak? Seriously. What good is the Word? I would rather not read the Bible and hear one word from God's own lips than to read my Bible every day and say, hey, you know what? I think I'll go make a theology of this as the Orthodox Jews and as every Jew knows. Read the Torah. Every time I hear somebody tell me read my Bible every day, I just go, Torah, Orthodox, here we go, denominationalism 101, because they don't know how to disciple. Don't tell me to read my Bible. Tell me to follow Jesus. Tell me to walk in His Word. Tell me to learn, to study, to apply, to grow in the knowledge of the fullness of the Spirit of God leading me into all truth. For if I read that without there being anything else accompanying that, what does it profit me? What shall it profit a man if he gained the entire Bible and lose his very soul? What is real about reading the Bible? Man, the heathen read the Bible. The Mormons read the Bible, some of them. Lots of people read the Bible every day. I mean, I know lots of people that are devout readers and they get nothing from it. Nothing, and they are not anywhere closer to God than if the Spirit of God doesn't come upon them. They have nothing from the Word of God. It is a dead and dry book. And every Spur, whether it be Spurgeon, C.S. Lewis, Aristotle, not Aristotle, I'm trying to think of the church father. Uh, he was first, uh, third century church father. Without the Spirit of God, reading a book won't do anything for you. Hello? So, what should we do then, knowing these things that it's not about Aaron? It's not about the people's will. It's not about the worship. Although, worship helps. <laughs> Although, they seem to not know what they're worshiping, or how to worship, or where to worship, or where to, when to worship. It's not about sitting in the front of the church and ignoring the rest of the people, or trying to be, I'm demonstrating. You didn't open your mouth, so the people don't open your mouth. 
Get up and sing out loud with your mouth if you're going to sit in the front. Get up and be the example of a believer if you want to be in front. If not, sit in the back sometime. As most times, you know, you'll see a pastor kind of like, you know, they'll kind of do a sneaky, you know, and they'll pull around, you know, and they'll go out the back, you know, before, you know, the service, and they'll kind of stand in the foyer, you know, and they'll look at the church, you know, and they'll kind of watch the people for a minute, you know, and the Lord will speak to them. Then they'll go back up front, you know, like Chuck used to do, and come back out and then share. You know, sneaky stuff. You know, stuff that's between you and the Lord that no one else knows. That God is speaking to you. That God is inspiring you by His Spirit. To look at and examine yourself to see what God would speak to the people. Because, you know, I always know when a man's flipping, you know, and just shooting his mouth off. Because he's always talking about himself. He'll talk about his ministry, his wife, his kids, his car, what he learned, you know, where he came from, what he's doing, what he wants to do, where he's going to be, how he's going to be, what he's going to be. Frankly, that's men's ministry. You know, I always hear that all the time. Who cares? I don't. If I hear it more than once, then I know that they're lost. If I hear it three or four times, I know they're really lost. If I hear it five or six times, I'm looking around going, who are you telling? Why are we not hearing from the Spirit of God ministering to the people of God, the Word of God? Isn't that what we're here for? Isn't that what we do? Worship Him in spirit and in truth? The truth isn't Billy Graham's. The truth isn't Chuck Smith's. The truth isn't The Last Greatest Revival by Keith Green. The truth isn't by Greg Laurie. The truth isn't by Josh McDowell. The truth isn't an apologetic. The truth isn't some denomination. The truth is what has God told the man of God in the pulpit to speak today? To let me know what God wants for me today. Not just, hey God, the pastor prayed for all my needs. I'm glad. My need is to hear God speak. And if the man of God can't speak the word of God, I don't want to hear what the man of God has to say. Because that's not a man of the word. That's not a man that's teaching me anything that I need to know from God himself. Because if I have to go to God alone, in the midst of a church that should be his people assembling together and holding one another up in love, then my God... What a blasphemous thing we've become. Oh my God. What a dead church we are. And we've become Laodicea. Oh, we're wealthy. We've got all these things happening. Yep. We got so many people. You know. Just like children of Israel, you know, we got Oh, I don't know about a million Jews sitting down at the foot of the mountain. Hey, we're successful. We did it. We got it. Everybody came out of they all saw you, Gord. I'm wiping them out. Well, but Lord, you know, I mean, you know, we, we got them all together. We assembled the people. We evangelized Egypt. We got them out of there. We saw signs and wonders, and you know what? We brought them from Egypt all the way here, and here they are at your feet, God. They're ready to worship you. They're ready to know you. They're ready to... No, they are. You go and tell them what I want, Moses. You tell them they have sinned. You go down this mountain now. And tell them what you just prayed, because I wanted to wipe them out. But by my mercy and by my grace, they are forgiven, because you, man of God, interceded. And you know, I like that. I see men of God as men of prayer, but I don't always see men of God as men of their word. I often see men of God pray for and then do something else. I often see men of God say for and do something else. I often see men of God, quote unquote, play the Saul, King Saul, you know, that slayed his mighty, that God had anointed, that God had appointed, that was man, God's man of the hour, that was king over Israel, and conquered and did things in the name of the Lord and added to it. What? Oh, you know. We just took this from this other ministry. I mean, this other nation. You know, we, we kept a few of the cattle. We just took this from this other, you know, like, place we came from. You know, we added that to it. We just took all of this. We didn't do what you said, God, which was wipe out every man, woman, and child and start over and bring new wine. You know, I keep hearing this stupid thing and I've got, I got to comment on it because, you know, like I said, I didn't know where this devotion was going to go and I'm just, I guess, empty. Praise the Lord. At least the Lord knows that the honest truth is that with which you lift up before the Lord your God and let Him lead and guide. And I hear this thing about anointing from the 
old wine and new wine skins, and you know what? That's a lie. I hear ministries tell me all the time that they're going to sing a new song. No, they don't. Matter of fact, we got old songs being sung by another church being brought to this church in order to celebrate and enjoy that with which they have done because, after all, we have to be a church planting, not the Lord's planting, but a church planting of another man's ministry. We have to be that same style, that same format, that same influence daily, or at least I hear it you know, from the pulpit being told me this, oh, well, we're not of this ministry, but yet this ministry just told us what to do. Oh, really? Why did you say they told you to? Why not just say they suggested? Why not just say out of the abundance of your heart <clears throat> they were helping or an, a ministering? I find it very interesting, you know, that the ministries I hear aren't often the ones that I see doing what they say they're doing. And I found that true about myself so much so that I had to take years away from all ministry to look at every single word that I speak out of my mouth. Because I began to realize these words hung me by the throat. These words people listen to because I was anointed and appointed. God had laid his hands upon me. God had chosen me. God had given me of his spirit. God had so saved me in such a miraculous way that every single word was being watched. Oh, wait a minute, that's already said in the book of Revelation, isn't it? This book of remembrance, we're told in the Old Testament, as a matter of fact, I think it's Isaiah, this book of remembrance was written of those that spoke of the Lord often, that talked about his name, that chose to sing and to worship and spoke obviously about him all the time. They didn't talk about their fantasy team. They didn't talk about their previous ministry. They didn't talk about their life. They talk about the Lord, and a book of remembrance was open about them. And that's not the Lamb's book of life. That's not the ministry's book of life. That's not even the book of life that God has, you know, about every creature. It's a book of remembrance. What do you want to be remembered for? You want to be remembered that you kept talking about, you know, you well, yeah, I came from, you know, JJ and JoJo and, you know, Mimi and DD and, you know, framing and, you know, this, that, and the other thing, you know, and I'm like, Man, you know, if everybody else is going to act like there's something special, maybe I should flip out my mouth, you know, and start talking about, you know, name dropping. Because that's what it is. It's pride. Romaine was the first one that always kept telling me, you know, the way that you can tell a fleshy pastor is who's he talking about. Is he always talking about where he came from and the ministry he was a part of, or is he talking about what God is doing today? Because if God isn't doing something today with them, he has nothing to say. I always felt like Chuck came right out of the presence of God was teaching us. Now, I didn't stay there long enough to see if he ever quit doing that, but, you know, that's the way I felt. I always went to different Calvaries, you know, and I would, you know, visit them for a while. And my current wife knows this, you know, and previous wives do too. You know, I've been married before. And, you know, I would go to a Calvary, you know, and I'd sit there and listen, and, you know, I'd go, let's go to a different Calvary. I wouldn't always tell them, you know, now my wife knows why, you know, Lori knows why. I'd listen to what they have to say. If they weren't talking about the Word of God, if they weren't talking about something that was profitable, that was for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, if it didn't come from the Word of God and it wasn't feeding my sheep, as Jesus said, and the Spirit of God didn't bear witness with it to me, I didn't want anybody to hear it. I didn't want them to go there. I had meant so far as to take my family somewhere else. Now, when God sends you someplace to work, that's different. God sent me here to work. So I work. I do the work of the ministry. The people are still trying to figure out what ministry they're doing. They're still trying to figure out what the ministry is. They're still trying to figure out how to minister. And I just go about doing my business. You know, I'm just, you know. You guys go work out your spiritual solutions, you know. And I'm watching going, you know, really be nice to hear the Word of God. You know, I'm kind of, kind of waiting, you know. It's kind of like I'm excited about what's potentially there. I'm excited about what could happen. I'm waiting for that. 40 days, you know, when the book of Acts, the children of Israel, or the children of Israel, the disciples of Jesus waited and tarried in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come upon them because I'm not hearing any spirit. I'm not seeing any spirit. Oh, yeah, people are nice, you know, and they, they have a wonderful time and they go, it feels fun. You know, and then you just walk away, you know, without a grin on their face, and joy in their hearts, or laughter on their lips. And they can't remember a thing the pastor said. That's spiritual. Wow. I'd rather go out and sweep the parking lot. And, you know, 
That's what I do. I'm out sweeping the parking lot. I just, you know, just, just something I do. You know, it's like, well, you know, Lord, are you out here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, cool. I'll take it to the streets. God, talk to me. You know, so I'm sweeping the parking lot, talking to the Lord. You know, and I'm enjoying it. You know, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. You know, and I'm kind of like, Shh, you know, and I'm talking to the Lord and I'm sweeping, you know. And the funniest thing happened, the funny thing happened to me on the way to sweeping this parking lot. You know, I was just doing this on a, I forget what day it was, but, you know, I remember the pastor. You know, I remember this man of God whom I really love. I love this guy. You know, he's got such wonderful heart. He's got a great heart. I mean, he's, he's a man that's got a great heart. He's got a heart that seeks and wants to do the right thing. I'm not sure about how deep he is, but, you know, deep calls to deep, so we'll see. You know, I'm just letting him go, you know. Whatever God wants to do with him, hey, God wants you here, you'll be here. God doesn't want you here, you'll be out of here. You know, no matter whether you bought a house or whether you think you got it, God wants to move you so that you can learn more about Him. He'll move you, you know, or, you know, you'll have some crisis, you know, where cancer will hit or some child will die or some wife will, you know, perish or whatever, you know, in order to make you into the man of God you need to be. God forbid those things ever happen, but it happens, you know, and that's what God does, you know, because even with David, hey, you know, you sin, boom, you know, people wiped out. And you learn in ministry that your sin affects everyone in the ministry, if it's the ministry God has anointed you for and appointed. So I'm sitting there, you know, I'm kind of going, you know, like, uh, you know, talking to the Lord, you know, and praying for the church, you know, sweeping. And so he came up and kind of shared with me for a minute, you know, he says, well, you can come to the church, you know, tonight, and or, yeah, are you coming to church tonight to pray? I went, I am praying. Because he already told me that he knew about praying, you know, continually. Always, you know, he said that, oh, you know, because I asked him one time, you know, he, he came out to help me sweep, you know, and I love the man because he did. He, he came out and swept the parking lot. And he said, you know, I said, you know, well, why don't you just go inside, you know, and you, you be the pastor and you study, you know, and in the Word, you know. And he says, oh, well, I could be an attitude of prayer, you know. And I said, oh, you heard John Corsa teaching on that, you know. I said, yeah, John teaches that, you know. Now, I personally think that an attitude of prayer is a cop-out, but, you know, I'm just, sometimes some people do it. John, I know, does, because if you've ever been in a car with John Corson, that guy will pray anytime. <laughs> you know, we're praying right now. Matter of fact, right now while I'm talking to you, I'm kind of praying. You know, because I'm going, Lord, where are we going with this devotional? Lord, help us. You know, go, God, inspire us. But my point is this: I know that sometimes attitude of prayer is an excuse, and we have spiritual platitudes to answer to every person, and we can make shallow the Word of God, shallow our experience of God by not being honest about what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what we're seeing, and what we're considering. Right now, as you hear these words, that's what I'm doing. I'm not being shallow. I'm being sincere. I'm sharing out of the depths of my heart the agony and despair I felt recently without getting a word of God. I walked away going, do I stay up all night, Lord, you know, listening to you now? Do I pop on a tape, you know, and we only go listen to some video, you know? God, where are you? What happened? What happened? Why am I listening to my wife complain? Why am I being a part of this ministry of opening up to you the windows of heaven and praying and interceding and saying, God, take all these words that we're praying and don't let us sin, but rather give it to you and let's begin again and start over and say, hey, God, help us. Obviously, we're in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing. What's going on here? Why aren't we getting you? Where are you, Jesus? What's going on here? Yeah, you know, I'm not an ignorant believer. You know, I know when sin is gossip and when gossip isn't sin, meaning that you don't gossip to other people because you take it to the Lord in prayer. And I'm not saying that, you know, somebody's not going to take this video, you know, and maybe use it as some opportunity to say, see, you were gossiping or you were sinning. I'm going to say, well, yeah, okay, if you think so, praise the Lord. God forgive me, you know, grace and mercy apply. But if you really get down to the brass tacks of what discipleship is, if you can't tell someone, as Proverbs says, to rebuke them, if you can't feel honest enough about saying, hey, I didn't like it. You know, like say you go to a Billy Graham crusade, or like I heard a video and I watched it and I went, I didn't like it. Fluff and stuff. Sorry. Didn't minister to me at all. Got nothing out of it. I don't think it's going to go very far, but you know what? If you want to go there, go there. Praise the Lord. I'll bless you. 
Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Let them do like Chuck Smith prayed, that if the God of our Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, if the God and the Father of Jesus Christ is telling you to go do that, go do it. Just like the fall feast, you know, if you want to go be a Halloweenie, go be a Halloweenie. You know, if that's what God's telling you to do, I'm not, because God told me not to, so I don't. Doesn't mean I can't say, well, you know, God bless you, be a peace, you know, if that's what the Lord's telling you to do. I may tell and pray for you that God blesses you, and then sit back and watch and say, okay, <laughs> this will be a new experience for me, Lord, you know, wow, you know, it's like, cool. If God blesses them, God bless them. You know, it's just not for me to do. I don't do that. It's like, don't. No, thank you. No. It's not my ministry. You know, it's not something that I feel led of the Lord or that I have been told specifically of the Lord to do. As a matter of fact, I was told specifically, do not do. Touch not, taste not. Uh-uh. Not me, man. Two prophets wandering in the wandering in the wilderness of Israel. One young man was told by the Lord his God what to do. Go straight through. Do not sleep. Do not eat. Do not touch. Go straight through the land. Go immediately to your destination. And an old prophet came along and said, Well, you know, I see you're a prophet of God. And the guy says, Yeah. The Lord told me to go to, and he repeats it, Go to, straight through, don't touch, don't drink, don't sleep, don't go, whatever, just keep going. You know, and the old prophet says, Yeah, the Lord told me to come up and to tell you, Come over to my house, because I'm a prophet of God, too, you know. And you come to my house, and you come and sleep, you know, and in the morning you can take off, and you can go and do what the Lord told you to do. But tonight, he wants you to come with me and to rest. It's an interesting teaching. It's an interesting perspective. It's an interesting reality check, because both were prophets of God. One was old, one was young. The young man went with the old man. The young man followed the words and heeded the man of God because he said that God told him. In the morning, the young man got up, and as he left, he was eaten by a bear and a lion. Matter of fact, the lion chewed him up and the bear tore him up. And the old prophet went out, took the bones of the man, and buried him. That's a pretty weird story, Michael. Yeah, it is. Chuck Smith teaches it a lot kind of leaves it hanging a lot, too. <laughs> it's like, as the Spirit of God leads you, so maybe you should go. Who are you going to listen to? Me? Fool. <laughs> what are you going to do today? Your own thing? Fool. Where are you going to go? I don't know. Maybe I'll go to work. Fool. What should you do every day before you go anywhere in any way. Ask God. Seek God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. Let Him direct your path. If God doesn't tell you to go there, can I make it blunt like He just said? You know, you just read Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. God doesn't tell you to go there. Don't go there. If God didn't tell you to do that, don't do that. If God tells you to do that, you may want to try to learn from it because, quite frankly, God might tell you to do some stupid things at times. And you may be looking really stupid by doing them. That's the Spirit of God. But the only thing I can tell you is that if you're listening to the preponderance of the abundance of words, then there lacks not sin, according to Proverbs. In the multitude of words, in the multiplicity of words, as the Hebrew says, in the greater extension of that with which propagates itself, because the sound of their own voice they like to hear, and as they get wound up, they begin to talk more and more and more and more, and leave the word of God out. Unless they have an outline. Oh, uh, let me check out. Oh, I, I forgot. Oh, yeah, where are we at? You don't know? Wow, God's really confused. Maybe the Spirit of God ought to be teaching us as He inspires you. And if you're not inspired, shut up. I'm done. As a matter of fact, that's what happened one time. I remember in a Bible study, I think it was Romaine, he said, I'm not ready. God, I, I didn't have time. I, I got to tell you guys, you know, I, I, I was going to get ready. I was going to study. I was going to get all... I'm not ready. I don't have anything to say. 
God hasn't told me what to say. I don't want to say anything except for, you know, God God tells me what to say. And he started walking off. And I went, biggest shock of my life. Biggest shock of my life. Biggest eye-opening experience of my life. He turned around halfway off the stage, you know, at Calvary, and walked back up and he says, the Lord just told me, get back up there. So, here I am. I'm not prepared. I'm not ready. I don't have a thing to say. I don't know what God wants me to tell you people. And you are God's precious saints. So, I don't really know what we're going to do. So, let's pray. And he prayed and gave one of the best messages I ever heard from him. I was like, that's <laughs> Boy! But the shock of him saying and admitting the truth is something that I want you to take from this devotional. It's something that I want you to realize and recognize in ministry. Don't fake it. Everybody knows you are. They won't say a word. Matter of fact, most of the people will not come to you and tell you the truth. We're told that, as a matter of fact, in Proverbs, that flatterers and people will congratulate you and attaboy you and slap you on the back and tell you how wonderful you're doing when you're not. Rather, you should be looking for the man of God, the person who is honest and true, the person who is sincere, who looks at you and says, that sucked. You blew it. That worship was horrible. That was the worst sound I've ever heard. That was not even the word of God. What happened? Did you lose it, bro? I mean... Hey, you know, I mean, I love you, but, you know, hey, where, where did you go? What did God tell you to do today? Did, did God say all that? And you say, yes. I go, well, okay. I'd be the first one to say, hey, whatever God tells you to do, I'm backing up, man. I'm like, I'm backpedaling on my bicycle. Good thing I got those gears so that I can go, because you know what? Anytime somebody tells me God told them, I'm backing away. Okay. And I'll agree with them. Yes. They said, God told them, and I'll back you up 100%, whoever you are, no matter what you do. You go out and try to kill your son like Abraham? Hey, God told him. He told me that God said, take your son and go and offer him on the mountaintop, you know, for a living sacrifice. I may go tell the cops, you know, and say, hey, you know, the cops, you know, I, I, I know he said, and I'll back him up as much as he believes it's true. God told him, so I'll back him up to say that, yes, I agree that God according to what his faith is, told him, and God told me to call you. you know? So it's like, hey, I called the cops and you know, reported you. But my point is this. If God tells you, do it. But if God didn't tell you, don't do it. Look like a fool. Look like cancel a service. You know, well, I don't have something to do. I don't have anything to share. Does anybody out there have something to share? Whoa, they're not anointed. They're not the pastor. They're not the, the whatever. They're not the person in charge. Matter of fact, we can't let Jesus be in control of the church. He might choose to use someone else today. Don't tell me who's in charge of the church. Don't tell me who's in charge of the service. I know better. I have seen at times when churches do that. Keith Green did that. He got thrown out of a ministry because he stopped the service and prayed and then went in a different direction than what the quote-unquote ministers, pastors wanted because people were coming forward to rededicate their life and admitting sin in their life. And they were Bible students. They were back east. I forget some concert Keith Green gave him. They banned him. They said that he was wrong in doing that. He should have taken some other time and place to do that. Chuck Smith never invited Keith to come at Calvary, Costa Mesa. There's a reason why. <laughs> you never knew what you were going to get with Keith because the Spirit of God was leading him. And Keith was pretty blunt. Keith was pretty radical. If God told him something, he ran with it. And he did it. And if that meant giving up a contract you know, for billions of bucks or millions of bucks in those days or you know fame and fortune he did it he lived it I hear a lot of people give me a lot of excuses and a lot of stories and you know I'd be dangerously wondering if there wasn't somebody out in a congregation even as I'm sharing this now while you're watching if someone else who isn't far superior to I and knows the Lord more intimate than I do and shares a more of a reality in knowing the things of the Spirit than I know, 
doesn't come up and say to me, you blew it. Oh, wow. And they share something where I find out I did. I'd be recording another video, you know, devotional, and saying, I was confronted about my video or my devotional or something I wrote, and I was wrong. I, at the time, had prayed through it. At the time, had prayed about it. At the time, even said, I don't know what it's about, but I'm going to do it. And God said, do it. And the brother afterwards came to me and shared with me and told me this. And I went, wow. And I felt convicted and I knew that this was right. And I would come back and say that. Because I'm not afraid of being wrong. I'm not afraid of shooting off my mouth in the Spirit and saying the things of the Spirit without there being a directive of the person choosing to use their name unless they're dead like Romaine and Keith Green. Choosing to use, you know, the shame of my own experiences, you know, that, hey, who am I? I don't have, you know, like, uh, 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 what do you call those things? Ordination papers back there. Oh, sure, I could get them off the internet, no problem, you know, or I could go fill out, you know, a equal service ministry type of, you know, how much have you done in the ministry here? Do we get you this, you know, credentials, credits? Oh, sure, I could go borrow $10,000 and go get a free, you know, whatever, Bible scholarship, you know. Or I could go get some friends, you know, that have been in ministry and say, hey, you know, yeah, we'll sponsor you, man. Sign the name. That's not how God operates. It is how men operate. You know, they want to be secure. They want to protect themselves. Oh, yeah, you know, we got to make sure we got it covered. Okay. According to the law, yeah, we, we, you know, the law hasn't gone away. You know, it's still here. It's in America. We have the law. Saved by grace, though, thank God, because we're saved from the law, because the law will bind you up, confine you up, and, you know, put you into this little box, you know, that you can only work within that box, you know, so the law is like that, you know, and it'll protect you. The law will protect you. The law is good. The law protects you. But it confines you, too. And so, when you are willing to look at the Word of God, when you're willing to Give your life to Jesus, no longer a child of God. When you're willing to talk to Jesus and hear his voice audibly, when you're ready to grow up into the stature of the man of God who will stand the test of time before Nebuchadnezzar and be cast into the fire that you will not bow down and worship the idols of men, whether it be on Halloween, whether it be on Christmas, whether it be on Easter, wherever it may be, when you're willing to say yes to God and no to man, and I don't mean just in some token way where you say, oh, well, you know, next year I'll, you know, like not do Halloween. Well, it's not about whether you do it next year. God could tell me next year, do Halloween, and I would do it. The next year you could say, don't do Halloween, and I would not do it. Everything that the Lord tells you to do, that you should do. Because whatsoever it is that God is leading you in, that's what the Spirit of God is trying to teach you. To humble yourself. To be submitted to the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, with your passion, with your ministry, with your wife, with your children, with every living thing that he said on the Sermon on the Mount that you're not reading the last part that said, these sayings of mine I'm telling you to do. Because if you do, this is what you'll be like. A man who built his house upon the rock. But if you don't do even these least of things that I'm telling you, that I say unto you, you have heard it said, do this, do that, and the other thing. I say unto you, Jesus said. Then what are you doing? Why do you call yourself a Christian if you don't do the things Jesus said? Don't get me wrong. You may be learning. You may be going through a learning curve. You may be adapting. But what are you teaching the people? Which do you want to be? Do you want to be Aaron, a man of the people? Do you want to be Moses, a man with God? Now, Moses didn't make it into the promised land. Don't get your mistaken metaphors here wrong. Moses blew it. He got ticked off and pissed off and furiated and angry and boom, boom, boom. Slapped the rock when God said, tap the rock. And guess what happened? For the misrepresentation of God Almighty, he was forbidden from entering into the promised land. There's an anointing on all Calvary chapels. All of them. It came from Chuck Smith. It came from the Holy Spirit of God. It came down through this choice that Lonnie Frisbee, Chuck Smith, and Kay Smith prayed about, 
prayed for and God anointed. And you can see it in their life. Each person has a phenomenal life. The anointing went forth from them outward to all these different ministries. Wherever Lonnie Frisbee went after Calvary Chapel, the ministries prospered. He was a homosexual gay. Yeah, seriously. Started and helped start the Jesus movement. Was a part of that. He didn't die in sin, you know. He died not able to free himself from homosexuality. He died of AIDS, if I remember right. Or whatever it was. Similar to that. In Denmark, I guess it was. He could never free himself from that lust, that passion, that, that feeling. And yet, he still shared in the ministry. He still worked at times in the ministry. He still tried to relate Jesus in the best way that he knew how. And Chuck Smith spoke of him at his funeral, or spoke about him, he didn't go to his funeral, but spoke of him as being like a Samson. Hey, he's in heaven. He sought the Lord. He followed the best way he knew how. He still had issues. But the anointing that had come upon them, that had gone out, and is still here, and it exists in every single Calvary Chapel, although it may be a trickle, it may be a timbrel, it may be a dewdrop, it may be old wine, there's a blessing of beginnings, a blessing of starting in the Word of God. Now, where you go from there, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. If you're going to enter into the Promised Land, then don't be Moses, be Joshua. Do what God tells you to do. Joshua was told to march around the city and worship, not to, what, have a great evangelistic crusade. Uh, you know, we're going to witness to AI. We're going to make compromises with the you know, people of the land. We're going to adapt to their way of doing things. So they came up and said, look, Joshua, we heard that God is with you. We heard that these people, you know, we know that you have God. We, we just want to be part of that. And so, you know, they made a compromise. And Joshua was busted by the Lord. Joshua was a man of war. Joshua was a mighty man. He was a guy that wanted to kill, wanted to slaughter in the name of the Lord. And God says, look, I want to show you how I want you to do things. You don't fight. The battle belongs to the Lord. I want you to do this. So he goes out and he does it and he wins. Next time he says, oh, well, we don't need the Lord. We're going to go forward. You know, so he just goes ahead and takes that success and goes out and gets stomped on. Think about this for a minute. Joshua, man of God, just saw the miracles, just like Moses, just did the right thing, just realized that, you know what, it worked, goes out and does the wrong thing next. Now think about the people that died following Joshua. What cost for the learning of that man of God was it upon the person who died? Faithful to following that man. Oh my God. Let's fast forward to Jesus. Not one read was broken. Now one bruised reed, not one leaf leaning over was snapped. Not one little spark, one little flame, not one little quenching was extinguished. And yet I know right now that I can look around I can see a lot of pissed off people. I can see a lot of frustrated people. I can see a lot of angry people. What are we called to do? We are the light of the world. If we don't have the joy of the Lord, if we don't have the peace of God, if we don't have the love of God, and we don't have something to share with the people, we need to shut up. And I do. And I've taken that time when I did at different times in my life because I was anointed way back when and appointed and chosen and told and given and God spoke direct and said, and I stopped. I said, I'm not ready, Lord. You can tell me I'm ready. I'm not ready. Oh, look what I just did. You know, I'm not doing it. And I didn't. And I quit. I didn't share. I didn't tear. I didn't dare because I didn't want to trip anyone up. I didn't want to stumble anyone until God had spoken to me and taught me what was going on in my life and why I went through that experience. Because I didn't understand. It was like, hey, boy, yeah, God, I had all this stuff from the beginning. Now, why am I here? And, uh, like, where am I? What is going on? What is my identity? Who am I? And that's part of what we need to find for ourselves before we become, quote unquote, Joshua's, or Moses, or Aaron's, you know, or we go out the way of Balaam, or we go out the way of Balak, or we become, you know, Ananias, or we become Sapphira, or we become any other thing except for what God has made us to be, which is me. I am that I am, God said. 
And who I am is what I am. And God later says, I'm love. And a lot of people say, but what about that? <laughs> well, that's what love does. <laughs> but who are you? Who are you? Do you know, really? Because if you're trying to be a senior pastor, there's no such a thing. There is no such a thing as a senior pastor. That's theology. That's doctrine. That's made up. That's denominationalism. That's reformation. That's Catholicism. What are you? What are you? James said, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and a servant of God. And that's it. He never came up and said, call me pastor. By the way, did I mention that I'm the brother of Jesus? Did I mention that, hey, you know, yeah, I had some great stories. Let me tell you about when Jesus was 12. I could tell you some stories about Jesus. One book. One book, James wrote. One book. If there ever was a man that should have been more written of or more spoken of, we don't hear anything about Jesus' brethren and his mother and his... Well, we hear about his mother, but we don't hear about his sister and, you know, his sisters. Who did Jesus' sister marry? Hey, I'm brother-in-law of Jesus, sister-in-law of Jesus. Whoa! Ooh! I'm from Calvary! I'm from this Calvary! I'm from that Calvary! I so-and-so pastor! This so-and-so pastor! Who cares? If the guy's got a good word, great. Quite frankly, you know, I've been hearing a lot about this one pastor, and I'm going, I haven't heard anything good yet. I mean, I've read, you know, I've watched, I've listened to the message, I went, nothing for me. There's nothing for me. You know, Chuck, yeah, you know, I go, you know, I like Chuck. You know, there are things that I like about Chuck, there are things I like about Greg. Greg I don't use for Bible teaching, I use them for evangelism. I like what Greg's evangelism is. I like some of his discipleship materials. I like some of the things from Leroy Imes, from Navigators. I like some of the things from Campus Crusade for Christ. I like some of the things from uh, Pancho Juarez. Really interesting, you know. I like, I really like, you know, a, the Bible teaching of um, Rich Chafin, you know, because it just, whoa, talk about being on the same page, man, I'm like, Dude, did you go where I went? And I find out he was a janitor at Calvary. I was like, oh, you pastor too, and then became pastor. I was like, wow, man. I'm like in awe, you know, because I just kind of sit there at his feet and I just go, man, it's all about Jesus. <laughs> this is cool. It's like, <laughs> you just want to go, yeah, you're just, you're waddling in the blood of Jesus. You know, that's the way it feels like. You know, you go for his teaching and you go, <sighs> Give me more. <gasps> My wife and I both, we just sit there, we walk, watch his service, and we're like, <sighs> you know. And I've been that way with um, uh, other pastors, you know, that aren't Calvary. You know, it's like, you know, some, most, no, some, yes. At times, you know, Corson, wonderful, Dean, dynamic. Missler, wow, you know, I love being in my expansion of mind. You know, when I want to be intellect and I want to, you know, debate theology or argue theology, man, you know, let's go to Missler, you know, because you guys obviously aren't getting much taught in the Bible schools because, <laughs> wow, where did you go wrong, you know? So I go back and, you know, I look at one of the early Bible schools where, the, you know, the one guy that was teaching, you know, theology, you know, he's got this chalkboard, he always gets up, you know, boring, but, you know, you listen to him and you watch, you go, hmm, yeah, that's pretty good, man. You know, and you go, oh, okay, but that's not the Bible schools. The Bible schools are what, you know, people really call discipleship class. Discipleship 101, you know, it's like, oh, well, we're going to teach you this. Well, it's 101. It's not a master's degree. It's not a growth degree. It's not living with the teacher, you know, like Jesus did with his disciples. It's not living out what we're talking about or what we're saying about. I want to see you live what you say. Because I've heard lately about, you know, people going to Bible schools. They says, yeah, I was going to Bible school and my roommates, you know, they were such carnal Christians. Pretty successful Bible school. <laughs> wow. Well, I was going to Bible school, you know, and this guy was doing that and the teacher was doing this and the teacher, you know. Wow, I'd quit. Lord, take me where I need me to be. You need me to be. But I don't want to learn that way. I don't want to even have anything to do with it. I have never been to a Bible school. I went to Wednesday night studies because at one time Chuck Smith started this school of the Bible, he's called it. And it was like on Wednesday night you could get Malcolm Wilde teaching evangelism, Romaine was teaching gifts of the Spirit from the book of Acts. Um, let's see... A woman was teaching Matthew. 
a Jewish woman. Um, let's see, I can't think of all the different people that were teaching them, but they were using the what used to be called the multi-purpose room that now is probably the school. <laughs> can't think of what it's been now, but at that point in time it was the multi-purpose room. So all these different little tiny rooms had classrooms that were the school of the Bible. You know, it was like, I guess, the early, maybe the early conference center, maybe the early Calvary Bible College eventually, you know, but in those days, my mother went there, I went there Wednesday night, it was wonderful, you know. Women teaching, yes, the Chuck D. Smith did have women teaching, you know, and you would and teaching men, you know. I went to it. I went to the Matsy class. I thought, oh man, she's Jewish. Oh, yeah. I went to go see what she had to say. I was like, whoa, boy. To this day, I still don't hear anybody teaching like she did. I was like, well, well okay, fine. Go figure, you know. Or like, you know, there were other classes for. Oh, and um, there was, uh, I think it was Rick Boyer was teaching something else. And someone else was teaching something else. But it was for discipleship. It was the school of the Bible. It was to grow up, to mature. Because so many people were coming in, they didn't, you know, you can't just get what you think you want, you know, and growing up and making disciples by, quote unquote, read your Bible or go, go on a Sunday, you know, morning, which Chuck said, Sunday morning is a white washout. Go Sunday night to get taught. Oh, I forgot. We're not doing that. Uh, well, you know, for us, then it'd be like go Sunday and Wednesday, or like you know, some churches, you know, they do different things. You know, they may not go Sunday morning. Maybe they go only on a. Gosh, I don't know. In Utah, it sounds so confusing because I can't even figure out what everybody's doing. You know, it's like they skip Sunday night, but they like Sunday morning. Well, that's new. I wonder if the Mormons influenced that. Sounds like it. So they skip Sunday night, but they do something else instead. You know, so that's okay. Well, because they got to work Monday. I guess that's the way it works. You know, but they have a Wednesday, which is cool, you know, midweek study, okay, I got you. You know, but that's really not kind of like a study. It's more like kind of like a, you know, we're family, so it's kind of like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, I'm just, what's going on the rest of the time? Nothing. Really? Okay. We don't have, you know, anybody anointed, appointed, and directed. You know, they haven't gotten their credentials down yet. Oh, how are we going to teach them? You know, except that somebody teach them. How shall we lead them? Except somebody lead them. How? How are we going to do this? You know, where's the structure? Where's the discipline? Where's the coordination? You know, I mean, sure, the things of the Spirit are led by the Spirit of God. Because after all, let's look at what the Word of God says. Let's consider these things. What man or man we ought to be in being led of God, to being seeking God, to hearing God, and to doing what God said. Because. Chuck always said it that way, and I don't want to keep bringing up Chuck, but you know, he's one person that people seem to identify, especially if they're in the Calvary Chapel movement. But Chuck always said, hey, you know, God's telling you to do something, go do it. So I did. Other people did too. Some of them are in mega ministry. Some of them aren't. Some of them are behind the scenes making mega ministries. There's a, an anointing going on. And believe me, it's not necessarily with the person that's up front. Matter of fact, I've seen some real flaky pastors make it eventually. You know, it took them about 20 years, long time, but a lot of support ministry around them. Hey, those flaky pastors, they made it. You know, they're they're now in some, you know, mega kind of ministry type thing, you know. And and their message has changed. You know, they gradually start off as being like worthless. You know, it's like, eh, you know, okay, we'll stick it out, you know, and wonder about, you know, but then we'll get there when we finally finds out about what he should be teaching about. You know, and it's Jesus and the Word of God. And that's it. Simply, simply, you know, just sh sh Genesis, Revelation, we don't have to get confused. Oh, well, we gotta, you know, we got to stop this for a while, or we got to change this, or we can't do it that way, we don't want to do it this way, we got to do it that way, we don't, we don't like anybody else, so we, we got to reach the millennials. We gotta... If it ain't about Jesus, what's it about? You know what I mean? I keep going. Jesus. On the top of my page, you know, whatever it may be, Jesus. You know, i got to look down, because it's the only time I'm ever going to hear about Jesus. I look down, and I just go, Jesus. Unless I'm, you know, like listening to, you know, Rich or Keith or Greg or Lori or somebody else that wants to talk about Jesus. Because it's all about him. It's not about, you know, what most people are talking about. And I'm a boring Christian, believe me, because I like to talk about Jesus. So, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. I think that's Jesus. I think Jesus is the Lord of hosts, so it's... My spirit, the spirit of Jesus. Oh, sure, it's the Holy Spirit, but we got to be careful here now because there's a lot of people running around saying the presence of God, the presence, or uh, we want to be spirit led. You, okay, what spirit are you talking about? Because I've heard this expression lately a lot from pastors. 
we're spirit-filled, spirit-led, and spirit-this, and I'm going, does any part of that spirit ever talk about Jesus? Because if it doesn't, God said that when he sent his spirit, he would not speak of himself, but he would speak of me, Jesus said. So if I don't hear Jesus being mentioned, I don't know what spirit you got. But for me, it ain't the spirit that God said that he would send me, that Jesus said would speak of him. It may be some spirit. Woo! It may be the spirit of truth, the spirit of light, the spirit of conviction, the spirit of all those seven spirits that are before the throne of God. I'm not so sure it's the spirit Jesus said that I could have. Because the one I got, I want to know more about Jesus. I want him to reveal Jesus to me. I want him to open my ears that I would hear Jesus. I want him to open my eyes that I would see Jesus in you. I want him to open my mouth that the only thing that I have to talk about is... You get the picture? Jesus! Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord or been his counselor and has taught him? <laughs> it's an awful lot of people telling me about what the Spirit does. Who has been... Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord? Oh, the Spirit are subject to the prophets. Oh, we have to do everything in order and seemly manner. We have to keep control. We don't want to let the Spirit of God take over. You get what you ask for. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up in his train for the temple. I know a man of God that if he would just shut up and talk about what God shows him, would have more than he ever dreamed of. I know a man with God that if he would just listen to what God is saying and tell us what God has spoken, he would have everything his heart desires. I know a man that right now could have a mega ministry that he really wants if he would just do only what God has told him to do. Hmm. Careful what you pray for. You might get it. But I hope it's what God is in the midst of. And God just doesn't give it to satisfy someone's desire. The wind bloweth whither it will. You neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going. So too is everyone that is led and born of the Spirit. Born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. My Spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not, the battle is not yours, but God's. The Lord saveth not with the sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. The things that I've seen are the things I speak of. The things that I've heard are the things that I bear witness of. The things that I, I've handled by own hands are the things that I know about. I can't talk about giving birth. I've never given birth. I can't talk about being at board meetings because I've never been in a board meeting. People will talk about things they've heard that they don't know. Like, you know, Jewish stuff or Jesus movement or what they thought they knew and, and what they think they know and they don't know and then they tell people what they don't know and the people listen and sometimes take it and run with it 
to their utter destruction, if it's something that's serious enough. Every idle word spoken, we're told, is accountable to God. And I, I fear that in some ways, but I also rejoice in that because it made me realize if I'm going to be a man of God on the Internet, if I'm going to be a man of God in behind-the-scenes talking face-to-face -face with the people that are ignored or not followed up on because they somehow have gotten angry at what the pastor said, or somehow they've fallen through the cracks because they were overlooked, like I was at Big Calvary, when I was dying in the hospital and no one came and visited me. When I was hungry and no one came and fed me. When I was thirsty and no one brought me water. It took me a while to find those churches that do that. To find those people that do that. Oh, Chuck knew that. He knew. He knew that times that there were things that were wonderful about Big Calvary and there were things that were so wrong that he had to make corrections at times. Cut off branches. Cut people off. Even set them aside. Even let them go do what they want to do. Knowing full well they were heading in the wrong direction. And he prayed for them. He cared. He was compassionate. He was merciful. I can't stop anyone from doing what they want to do. I don't really want to. They have their own Hagar's. They make their own mistakes. Sometimes the consequences of their mistake go all the way into this day, as Abraham did. Abraham is the father of our faith, but he's also the one who started the Arab nation, Hagar. He's also the one who has caused and is the one who by his own effort, by his own sin, created the animosity between the Israeli Jew and the Israeli Arab. And except for the grace of God, except for the love of God reaching down to Hagar and blessing her, there would be no Arabs today. There would be no Arabic people. There would be no Arabia from Hagar's own loins for following faithfully what Abraham told her to do as a slave unto him. And yet she abused her point and her privilege, even as Sarah, a representative of the church, abused her privilege and point. Oh yeah! God promised and God used Sarah. But she also sent the wrong message to Abraham. She also told the wrong story about, quote unquote, what God was doing. Be very careful about your relationship with God. That no ministry you have, no idea you think is wonderful, no car, no Harley, no wife, no child, no circumstance, no height, nor depth, nor principality, no power, no deception, no experience in the past or experience in the future or present will separate you from the personal relationship that you have to have in these latter days. Deception has gone out into the world and you don't think it's going to be that big a deal. You don't think it's that important, that little whisper, you know, that you were bad-mouthing somebody and yet they don't come to church anymore. That little, you know, we're going to talk about this person, but we're not going to use their name like I'm doing. And I'm the first one to admit, hey, the person, that, if they listen to this, they know who I'm talking about. They know what I'm talking about. They are convicted of the Spirit of God. Even as I have to go out and find this person and try to find out why and how come God would inspire a man of God to talk about one of his parishioners one of his people in such a way that they would be humiliated in such a small community in such a way that wow was it really that big a deal that you wanted to sacrifice on the altar of your ministry a person David did David was willing to kill to get what he wanted oh my God we who are led by the Spirit 
filled with the Spirit that are born again as the Spirit leads need to yield ourselves to the humbleness of being broken before God and there but for the grace of God go I stand before a holy God and say oh help me to take off my shoes help me to walk humbly before your name help me to be what you want me to be in this place in this time because God I feel like Ezekiel though I am I feel like Ezekiel Was it Ezekiel? Was it Ezekiel? yeah Ezekiel I feel like Ezekiel though I'm not I'm the only one Lord where's everyone else and there's three hundred prophets over here and there's everyone over there no, I, I already know that one. You know, it's like I never failed falling for that one. I used to think of that one at one time. Then I came along, and then just recently, before I even came to Utah, I thought, "Oh, well, Lord, what happened to all the godly men of teaching the Word of God?" Because you know, like uh, you know, some were talking about politics. There were, matter of fact, Christian pastors that I was arguing with. You know, I mean, arguing the Bible, telling, "Look, you should be sharing the gospel. Don't tell me to vote Mormon." Don't tell me to get into an election to try to save the nation when I'm trying to save souls. Don't tell me that you want to go against some man that I'm trying to witness to. Don't tell me that you've got something more important to do about stopping them from doing their actions, which they're only doing what they're used to do because they're not saved. And you expect them to do anything else? And I'm trying to share the gospel with them and you're in my way? Let me show you what God will do and I'll pray for you. God forbid that we stop anyone from seeking the Lord their God with all their heart, their soul, their mind, and strength. Because if we do, God should remove us from our place. And He will. Because the letters to the seven churches was very blunt. Repent. Repent. Because He'll remove our lampstand. He'll remove the candle. He'll remove that place. He'll take that person out of the way if we ever stand before anything that stops a person from coming to Jesus Christ. And I don't mean the ungodly. I mean the godly. I mean those that we have somehow hindered the work of the Spirit. We have somehow prevented the free flow of God to go so that they would know the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have taken the things of God and despised that with which is holy by making it frivolous from the pulpit, to making it meaningless to the people, to make it trampled under the feet. We have stomped on the blood of Jesus Christ. Because it's not that important anymore. It's not that priority for the people to know Jesus. Read your Bible. I'm glad for that. Pray. I'm glad for that. Come to us. I'm glad for that. But you know what? I'm not coming to you unless you tell me about Jesus. I don't want to hear anything you have to say unless you're telling me about Jesus. I don't even want to know what you're doing unless it's all about Jesus. Because if it's not about Jesus, you're not going to get a successful ministry ever in your life. You'll have a ministry all the days of your life. Just like Saul did till he died. You'll have a ministry, but you won't want it. You'll see it, but you won't like it. You'll taste it, but it will be bitter in your soul. And it will make you bitter. Because if it's not about Jesus, it shouldn't be done. I have looked at and stopped at times, even in the last 10 years, video. Because I, I question myself. I, I constantly look at myself. I go, Lord, man, you know, you know, some of the stuff is a little yeah, edgy. You know, some of the stuff has got like kind of a little cut to it. You know, God, am I off track? Am I like losing it here? I don't want to do anything until you tell me to do it. Man, did you talk about words like bursting out of my bones and exploding in my soul and making me go to be made whole before the Lord my God. Not because I was insane, because I shut up. Oh, whoa. Because you see, we just read something very interesting, didn't we? We just considered something from the Word of God that is very important for us to hear. That is very, so much crucial that we need to know the most important thing that we should be about all the days of our life. Not by might. I don't have any might. I, there's nothing I can do. Not by power. Not by the day that the Lord has made because it happens to be whatever special day it is. Not by whatever we think we should do, but by my spirit, 
says the Lord of hosts, by the Spirit of Jesus, by the Spirit of prophecy, by that which reveals Jesus to us, by that with which we see the Lord our God, whom we serve day and night with fear and trembling and with fastings and prayer, with going out to be Jesus to someone. You know, I just heard them. <sighs> saddest news I've ever heard in my life. One of the biggest travesties that I just don't know how I'm going to react to yet. Because I'm not satisfied. And when I'm not satisfied, I go yell at God. I do. I don't have a problem with yelling at God. It's not like this on the you know, video that we're sharing this devotional. It's more like God and I are having a big knockdown, drag out fight. I'm mad. And I'm like, you said and from that moment on, we go for it. <laughs> I'm usually reduced to tears, but then even when I'm crying, it'll take a few hours, maybe days, maybe weeks, even sometimes years, but God will come through, you know, and He'll tell me, and He'll show me, and He'll do it, because He'll do it. I won't do it. I won't change anything. I'm not going to stop somebody from doing what they're doing. But you know, I just heard there is not ministry to the poor and needy in Tuella. That the people who want food can only go to one place. The people who are hungry can't find a ministry. They have to go and beg at the doors of the church to get it. And the churches don't have something out there for them. It has to be some kind of extra work. I was appalled. I was disgusted. I was shocked. I'm abhorrent. I'm mad. Oh yeah, I'm furious as a matter of fact. How dare we? That's what I keep thinking. I was told that, you know, this valley doesn't have a shelter. I just hope it's a lie. Christians have churches in the valley. The quote-unquote Bride of Christ has a uh, buildings that are semi-occupied most of the time. The majority of their time, it's empty. And there's not a shelter for the homeless in that valley. There's not a place for the people that are homeless to go. Matter of fact, they're the dirty, disgusting people that, you know, you don't want to bring into your church because guess what? You know, they got issues. You know, some of them are mentally health, you know, challenged. Well, by the law, we can't do this. Yeah, go ahead and tell me where the widows and orphans are going now. I guess the part that's hard is that I know this ministry, you know, that I'm a part of or that I'm helping to, you know, God sent me to. It's so young, it's not their responsibility, really. I guess. They're too new to be able to, you know, have a structure in place because they're really not structured. They don't have any kind of structure at all. Matter of fact, they're probably still doing things from their old home church than what they're doing in the local church because they're not using local people, but they're letting them participate. You know, there aren't any church secretaries, you know, there's no church office, you know, there's kind of like, well, you know, we're just kind of like, you know, doing it, you know, we'll get there, you know, sooner or later, you know. So, yeah, you know, just give the pastor a call, you know, he'll do it, he'll take care of it. But the widows and orphans, you know, the, the money comes in, the money goes out, you know, we got a nice church, you know, it's growing, I'm, I'm blessed by it, you know, I just saw some beautiful leather seats, you know, and nice, new, beautiful LCD TV, you know, and I just sit in a church looking at the words on the, the, the bulletin boards and the sound systems, you know, and I think, yeah, and the comfortable chairs, this is nice. This man has lived on the street. This man has done what I say to other people to do. Don't tell me about widows and orphans. I bring them into my house. Don't tell me about, you know, the poor and needy. I bring them and I have been with them and I go to gospel missions. And I'll share the gospel there and we'll go start one. 
Because you know what? If God tells me to go to Tuella and start a gospel mission, so help me God, I'll go. I'll give up whatever it is we're doing right here, right now, in this apartment, and suffer the consequences of stupidity rather than see somebody sit there and say, God, where are you? All I wanted was something to eat, and they're sitting outside my church, the church I'm participating in, because the doors are locked, and they don't have a phone, and they can't call the pastor. They can't walk there. They can't get there. Can you not pray one hour? Jesus said to his disciples. Keith Green sang a song that said, the church just can't fight because it's asleep in the light. Yeah, as long as you can make it to a Sunday morning, hey. As long as you can come, you know, well, we don't go Sunday night. You can pray with us. If you can somehow get to one of us, you know, homeless man, shelterless people, widows and orphans, the person in the hospital. Hey, you know, just make sure you get to somebody that can tell somebody else about it. Because you know what? When I need it, I know nobody was there. And as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. I drive to this city every day. I mean, not every day, but, you know, so many days a week. And I drive past sheep, you know, and I... I look at these sheep and I go, man, that's beautiful. Because I've seen goats. I don't like goats. I've had goats. I've, I've had a goat in my life. I don't like goats. I mean, maybe the car, fine. But, you know, goats, no. They'll eat everything. They'll chew everything. They'll spit on everything. They'll stink up everything. Matter of fact, I don't like goats. No, I, don't, I just don't want to deal with goats. Sheep, they're cute. You know, they're pinned up because they get caught up into all kinds of things. But that's why they're pinned up, you know. And you, you got to feed them, you got to water them, you got to take care of them, you got to minister to them. You know, you got to find the one that when they're left, you know, they're gone. And that reminds me, I got to get off this devotional now to go find the one that's ticked off. But when I heard that we don't, you know, we need to reach out somehow and do ministry, and I, I kept thinking. When the person, after the person told me that we needed to do ministry, you know, I was shocked because then I asked someone, you know, of the people that live there, I said, well, you live here. I said, you know, do any of the churches here have, you know, like a food box ministry? Do they, do they actually feed anyone? No. The Lutherans don't? There's no Lutheran family service? Do the LDS? No. Now, I think the LDS probably does. I don't know because I'm, the LDS is usually pretty good about doing that. And they're heathen. Or they're, you know, not heathen, but they're a zeal for God without the knowledge of it. They don't have Jesus. But they do have good, usual works. They have lots of works, just like the Catholics. I, I'm sure if there's a Catholic church there, they have some kind of ministry, which I, I, I need to check and see. Because if there's nothing out there for the poor and needy, if there is no one to hear them crying out in the wilderness, if there's no one hearing that voice that says, I've read your books. I've heard your magazines. I've seen you on the internet. I've heard about Calvary. Where are you? Oh my God. Oh my God. What am I? If not but a hypocrite. And I don't mean the pastor. I don't mean the church. I mean me. If I myself, having just heard this word, don't do something about it. Oh my God. So I pray, Oh my God, who hears the cries of your people, who reached out after 400 years into Egypt and said, I have heard their cries, I will send them a deliverer. Lord, here I Send me. Amen.